Hey, Prime members, you can listen to American Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. Between 1999 and 2020, more than a half a million Americans died from drug overdoses involving an opioid. The number of deaths continued to rise year after year, with about 80,000 people dying in 2021 alone. The origin of the crisis can be traced back to the 1990s, when doctors increasingly began prescribing opioids like OxyContin. Purdue Pharma, the company behind OxyContin, claimed their drug was less addictive than other opioids, and that because their painkiller had a lower potential for abuse, It could be prescribed widely, offering a revolution in the treatment of pain. But those promises ignored a troubling reality emerging across the country. Americans were becoming addicted to OxyContin and using the drug to get high. And when Purdue Pharma reformulated their painkiller, making it harder to abuse, many users turned to heroin in order to feed their addiction. According to the CDC, this second wave of the epidemic began in 2010, with more and more Americans losing their lives to the powerful street drug. Only three years later, in 2013, the epidemic took another turn. Americans began dying from synthetic opioids like fentanyl, a drug that, according to my guest, reporter Julie Wernow, has turned into a widespread catastrophe. Wernow is a reporter at The Wall Street Journal. She writes about health policy and medicine, and her stories have looked closely at the evolution of America's opioid epidemic. In our conversation, we'll discuss why fentanyl has found its way into a variety of black market drugs, and we'll trace the drug's global spread from its production in China to its increasing manufacture by cartels in Mexico. Our conversation is next. Julie Wernow, thank you for speaking with me today on American Scandal. Thank you for having me. So there have been for a while now a lot of grim stories about fentanyl, people overdosing and dying. But let's start with the basics. What is fentanyl? So fentanyl is actually a heavily regulated legal medication that's usually prescribed for pain in cancer patients, people who are um, in chronic pain post-surgery and have developed a tolerance for other opioids. It can be given as a shot, a patch, put on your skin, sucked like a cough drop, etc. What we're talking about largely when we talk about the opioid crisis is an illicit form of fentanyl. This is a powder. It's often mixed into other drugs and does have the same effect as this legal medication, but is being cooked up in illicit laboratories, mostly in Mexico. And one of the problems of fentanyl, other than its ubiquitous access, is, I guess, its potency. How easy is it to overdose? Incredibly easy, which is why we're seeing so many deaths from overdoses now. To give you a sense, just two milligrams of this powder can cause an overdose or death. That's like a couple grains of salt. So it, it's such a small amount and it's so potent that it's very easy for it to go quickly in the wrong direction. Well, let's get a handle on the scope of the problem. How many people are overdosing and dying from fentanyl? How does that compare to other drugs? So if you look at The number of overdose deaths that we're seeing at this point per year, I mean, we're at record levels. It's nearly 107,000 overdose deaths in 2021. To give you a sense of the scope, that's about two-thirds of all overdose deaths in the U.S. involve these in synthetic opioids. That's a, a category that's mostly fentanyl as the major drug. To put it another way, in 2011, about 6% of a 41,000 overdose deaths involved these synthetic opioids. Last year, these drugs were involved in 66% of overdose deaths. 
So the breadth and scope of this problem has just massively increased. And at this point, most of the overdose deaths that you're seeing are from illegal fentanyl. Now, you've described fentanyl as a drug that has legitimate uses. How did it transform into an illicit drug over the last decade or so? And why is it so widespread? It's an excellent question. The very short answer is money. Uh, Making this drug is just wildly cheaper than growing crops, like what we used to see, you know, when heroin was the main problem out there in the market. This is a drug that initially we started seeing illicitly manufactured in China, and it was coming across to the United States through often orders on the dark web. People could purchase it from chemical manufacturers inside China and have it just shipped to the U.S. They could pay in cryptocurrency. It was a very difficult market to crack. What happened is that China and the U.S. actually had uh, a moment of working together on this problem, and China cracked down on the illicit fentanyl market inside their country. And what we saw was, like many things in the drug market, it simply shifted somewhere else. And so now you have the Mexican cartels purchasing what are called precursor chemicals. These are the ingredients that are used to make fentanyl from labs inside China, and then uh, concocting and putting it all together inside these Mexican cartel drug laboratories. And so it's just a very difficult nut for us to crack. We've got a constantly changing, evolving market with, you know, these cartels are essentially giant corporations and they want to save money and make money. And this is a much easier way to do it than growing opium and turning it into heroin and getting it across the border. Let's stick with, I guess, the first phase of the fentanyl explosion here, and that's the China-based manufacturing. You mentioned that they were ordering fentanyl directly online, I guess, via dark web avenues like Silk Road or, or websites like that. What and when did the U.S. government do when they realized this was becoming a health crisis, and how did they convince China to cooperate? Well, at the time, you know, this was a few years ago, and it was actually a successful point of collaboration between the U.S. and China. China didn't really want their chemical manufacturers to be involved in the drug trade. You know, it creates all kinds of secretive crime organizations and, you know, underground banking relationships, et cetera. And so in 2018, China worked with the U.S. They restricted the production and sale of two of the most common ingredients for the drug and then um, actually cracked down on fentanyl and any of its analogs, which are essentially fentanyl-like chemicals. And it really worked. We actually saw, you know, if you talk to law enforcement, this sort of stop or at least slow to a trickle, this fentanyl that was coming directly from China. Now, the U.S. has adopted a much tougher posture toward China. And China has also grown much more assertive about defending its interests. And so as a consequence, the cooperation on combating the drug trade has really broken down. So despite the fact that, you know, there's evidence that these ingredients uh, that are being shipped directly to these manufacturers inside Mexico are coming from China and to some extent India, China's stance on it is that essentially the opioid problem is America's and America's alone, that it did what it could to help, but that America needs to deal with its demand problem and not China. So now Mexico, in phase two of this evolution here, is uh, the site of manufacturing for most of the fentanyl. I suppose this is an example of how difficult regulating or prohibiting drugs is. It's just another example of the whack-a-mole nature of it. As soon as uh, some success is uh, found in China, it goes elsewhere. Yeah, that's right. And you have to realize that unlike growing poppies that are needed for heroin, fentanyl production can shift very rapidly. You just, you know, need a few ingredients and it's an entirely synthetic process. And so you can shift production a lot faster than waiting for a long time to cultivate crops, for instance. It's also just much less expensive to make. So to give you a sense, 
the plant-based opium that would be needed to produce a, like a kilogram of heroin, that can cost producers about $6,000, while the precursor chemicals that you buy from China to make a kilogram of fentanyl cost $200 or less. So it's a much more profitable and cheaper endeavor for the cartels. Well, why do you think it was the Mexican cartels then that filled the vacuum so quickly? I suppose, you know, that the demand center, right, for opioids is the United States. And so the cartels, as a result, have, you know, really been able to, you know, always find a place for the drugs that they want to ship across the border, whether it be, um, you know, marijuana or opium. But I think that in this case, you know, as a result of the overprescription of opiates back during the earlier part of the first wave or earlier wave of the drug crisis, um, you know, it's just fueling the ability for the cartels to always have something to offer to the market in the United States. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense. The proximity to demand and that the cartels are already in this business of illicit drug trade. But why was fentanyl attractive to them? Fentanyl is in- incredibly attractive to the cartels because it's easy to hide. It's cheap to make. I mean, if you think about, imagine trying to, uh, like we talked about earlier, let's say, you know, essentially two sugar packets worth of this um, product could get someone high, you know, for a year. Uh, It's so much easier to sneak it into almost anything if you want to get it across the border or get it through the mail. There's just going to be a lot less loss in their supply, and it's a lot easier to churn it out. And it can be placed in a lot of different kinds of forms. People can smoke it. You can get it inside fake pills. You can put it across the border as a bag of dope, you know, that a heroin user might use. Uh, It's just incredibly versatile, incredibly cheap, and incredibly small and potent. Now, cartels are international organizations, and the demand for fentanyl and other drugs probably isn't the United States alone. Where else is fentanyl showing up? You know, um, this may seem surprising, uh, but fentanyl is still really, for the most part, a U.S. problem, and to some extent, an issue maybe in Canada. Apart from the British Isles and especially Scotland, there's really no indication of an opioid crisis comparable to that in the U.S. in any of the European countries. And so far, uh, you know, when we talk about the opioid crisis at all, and particularly the fentanyl crisis, we're really talking about the United States. So that's interesting. Do you have a theory of why fentanyl is uh, such a problem in the United States alone? Was it because of the appetite created by the earlier opioid crisis? Yes. I mean, I I definitely think that this is a result of the earlier opioid crisis. I mean, what you had people who started out on what they thought were, you know, legitimate prescription medications uh, that were not addictive then it turned out that for a host of reasons, these medications really were addictive. Then you had public health policy uh, that cracked down on the prescribing of these opioids. But, you know, the result of that directly was that you suddenly cut people off from a highly addictive medication, which led a lot of people to the street where they were seeking out heroin. And once you get into that market of, you know, buying drugs from, you know, the illicit drug market, you really become a victim of the supply rather than the demand. And so as, you know, the cartels or China or whatever criminal organization decides that they want to shift production to something cheaper or easier for them to produce, you're out there on the street purchasing your bag of dope, and you're going to just take whatever it is that you get. And so as a result, you see this very kind of easy shift from pills to heroin to fentanyl. Now, one of your colleagues actually visited a lab in Mexico where fentanyl was being manufactured. What did they uncover? 
That's right. Uh, my colleague uh, visited one of these labs where a cook there said he was making $2,500 a week running this one-man laboratory for the cartels. And what he saw there is this like roughly like 10 by 10 foot lab with these containers that are marked things like fentanyl, Chinese chemical, acetone. And he was literally mixing up, you know, the drug supply that will flow to the U.S. with a shovel. When you think about how easy it is to overdose on this drug, the idea that, you know, the quality control here is such that someone could be using a shovel or sometimes law enforcement find one of those bullet mixers that you make smoothies with to mix things up. It's definitely bootstrap and not a very, you know, highly controlled process that your drug supply is coming from. There sounds like um, there's some similarities to an older epidemic of the the DIY trailer park uh, meth lab. Yeah, I mean, you know, people are, they're smart, they're savvy, they find ways to make it work. It's not to say that drug dealers go out and specifically want to hurt or, you know, I guess, kill the, their clients. But, you know, you're doing what you can with the materials that you have and you're trying to make as much money as possible. And what happens there, you know, in an unregulated environment, obviously, is that things get doctored, they get cut, they get misplaced, they get mismixed, et cetera. And you could suddenly find that, you know, one bag of dope is not in any way the same as another bag of dope. So, yeah, I mean, this is not a, a new problem. It's just in a different iteration. I'm glad you brought that up because it has been a question that puzzled me why fentanyl is showing up in other drugs, why cartels would use it to cut into other drugs, and why they would be careless, as in, as you put it, to, to kill their customers. Yeah, this is a new and emerging problem happening with the fentanyl crisis, right? And we had three people in New York City die in the same night from cocaine that had fentanyl in it. One of the issues is we don't exactly know why fentanyl is showing up in so many other kinds of drugs. In some cases, uh, you have people who are doing that on purpose. You know, uh, for instance, some people are purposefully using meth and opioids simultaneously or in sequence um, to try to balance or offset the effects because meth is a stimulant that makes people feel energized, right? And at the same time, you have the issue that dealers might be sloppily cutting the drugs in the same place. So that could lead to cross-contamination and others um, might be lacing meth with fentanyl on purpose to hook more users. And then you end up with someone who is actually, you know, addicted to methamphetamine, who is now addicted to fentanyl as well. And you have, you know, a new client for that part of the market. What we do know is that close to two thirds of the people who died while on psychostimulants, you know, other drugs last year also had opioids in their systems. So this is a a growing and concerning threat. And I can imagine with the potency of fentanyl too, uh, this uh, the manufacturing process and just the tolerances required to do this responsibly. Uh, if you're using shovels and you know uh, kitchen mixers to make your product, it seems very possible to make deadly mistakes. You described somewhere that it was found that one side of one pill would be lethal and the other side was non-lethal. That's right. And I know I keep going back to this, but if you try to imagine just how small and potent this drug is, you know, you could have something like what looks like a Xanax, but, you know, is a fake pill uh, produced by the cartels. And you might decide, you know what, I'm going to test this drug. I'm going to find out if it has fentanyl in it. And you test a little bit of the pill. Well, that part of the pill might not actually contain the fentanyl that is going to make you overdose or possibly kill you. And so it is a, a difficult proposition to test these drugs if you're not testing the entire batch of drugs. Well, testing your drugs is an interesting uh, proposition. That's probably new and because of fentanyl. Um, you've spent a, a lot of time interviewing people who've spoken to you about their drug use openly. Are they seeking out fentanyl or, or are they testing it to avoid it? This is a great question. So one thing that happens when, you know, you become 
dependent on opioids is that after a while, you're really just using opioids to keep yourself from being sick. I hear this all the time from drug users, you know, that they haven't been high in years, that this isn't something they're doing because they enjoy it. They're doing it because if they don't have it, they're going to be incredibly, horribly sick. People describe withdrawal as drowning, that everything in your body is just screaming out in pain. And so, you know, in the beginning, when fentanyl hit the market, when people would hear that, you know, there was something out there that was more powerful than what they were using, people were seeking it out. They wanted uh, to get that high again. They were chasing that high. They were trying for something that would make it, you know, the pain not only go away, but, you know, give them some kind of euphoria. And of course, you know, eventually what happens also with fentanyl is you end up back in the same place. So there's that part of the drug market. At the same time, you know, eventually people don't really have a choice. So say you're a heroin user and you say, you know what, I don't want to chase that high. I am stable just using my bag of dope and I don't want to get involved in that market. I've heard about all the deaths. I've heard about everything happening. There is no heroin anymore in most parts of the country. The supply that is out there is fentanyl. And whether you want it or not, that's what you're going to end up with if you're an opioid user. So this is a long way of saying that, you know, that part of the market, the people who are seeking out opioids specifically, they may not really be testing their drugs at this point because what they really want to know is how much fentanyl is in my drugs versus is there fentanyl in my drugs? And um, the test strips that people are using out in the market really can't tell you how much fentanyl is in your supply. Where these test strips are incredibly useful and important for the users who are not seeking out fentanyl. Someone who is doing a bump of cocaine, someone who wants to know if a pill that they're being handed when they're at a club has any fentanyl in it. You know, is this a real Percocet or Xanax or what have you? Those are the folks who um, I think they're really trying to target at this point with those kinds of test strips. Well, let's talk about the testing and the test strips in particular, because this seems like a a, a very prepared behavior for drug users. How do these test strips uh, become so ubiquitous? Well, the truth is that I would say that if you talk to public health officials, that these test strips are not as ubiquitous as they would like them to be. Um, it, as you can imagine, it's kind of an awkward situation, right? I mean, the places where you would think that a test strip might come in handy would be like at a bar or at a concert um, or at a club. And these are businesses, right, who don't really want to sort of openly acknowledge that there is drug use going on inside their venues, so there are some groups that, you know, are showing up at these locations and giving out the test strips and encouraging people to test their drugs. But unlike the heroin market, drug users who occasionally use cocaine or a pill now and then are not necessarily A, as aware that fentanyl is a problem, and B, have a tendency to sort of trust their drug dealer or their friend or the person who gave them their supply. And so there is a lot of convincing that is still going on to try to get these kind of recreational, occasional drug users to take what is, you know, a nice looking, fully formed pill and dissolve it in water, which is what is required, test it with a test strip in the moment, and then let it dry out or what have you um, to use it, for instance, if it's cocaine. Yeah, it, it's not easy and uh, not everybody is on board. I guess that describing the difficulty of the testing procedure itself raises some questions of, one, how accurate are the tests and uh, how well are they performing in saving lives? So these test strips were actually originally designed sort of as like a drug screening tool, you know, something you would dip in someone's urine to find out, right, if they were using fentanyl. And I'm sure that they have accuracy issues like anything else, but for the most part, the places where they fall down are when we run into some of the problems we talked about. For instance, you know, not testing an entire pill, not testing the entire bag of cocaine. Those are issues that would definitely affect how accurate the test strip is going to be because you might just be missing the part of your drug supply that has the fentanyl in it.
So let's, I, I guess, shift to um, what the public policy response is to this crisis. I guess one avenue would be to expand access to these test strips, but that seems like only a very partial way to address the problem. That's right. I do think that the one area where China is right here is that we also need to be dealing with our demand problem, right? And in order to help lower the demand for these drugs, what you really need is treatment. And so we are seeing that, you know, the Biden administration is pretty focused on a few different areas, one of which is getting treatment into more places, making it more accessible, et cetera. And then the other is on these kinds of prevention tools. So the CDC has actually endorsed the use of these fentanyl test strips for testing drugs, even though uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration actively isn't regulating them for that purpose. And you're seeing some cities uh, and counties and states starting to decriminalize them. In other places, they're still considered illegal drug paraphernalia. And that is just kind of the nature of America and, you know, the varying views on drug policy. We're also seeing that one area that the Biden administration is specifically focused on is just a very baseline level saving lives. And so they've really endorsed tools for reversing overdoses that do occur just to keep people alive because of how rapidly overdoses have grown in the last few years. This is obviously, you know, just a very, very baseline measure. It's not going to end the demand for drugs, but their theory is if you keep people alive, then they'll live to get into treatment and possibly reduce their drug use. And in terms of reversing overdoses, I I assume you're talking about uh, the drug Narcan. That's right. So Narcan is a brand name of a drug whose scientific name is naloxone. Uh, Narcan is a very popular form of this drug because it's very easy to administer. You can put it in someone's nose and use it like a nasal spray to reverse an overdose. But what this drug naloxone does is it binds to the opioid receptors in your brain and can not only block the effects of opioids, but sort of knock the opioid off that receptor Uh, which is incredibly important because it's when these opioids are sitting on your opioid receptors, that's when you see slowed breathing. Eventually, you know, people stop breathing, they turn blue. And this drug in some ways is really a miracle. I mean, it it just knocks that right off. And pretty much within a couple of minutes, someone comes back to life. In the instance of these two methods of preventing fentanyl overdoses, the test strips and, and Narcan, how easy is it to obtain either of them? Well, the good news is that it's actually very easy to purchase and carry around test strips and Narcan. Uh, for instance, all of the uh, pharmacies in the United States um, have these standing orders that have been put in place by their legislators, allowing them to give you Narcan or Naloxone if you ask for it uh, without a prescription. And so I I went into a CBS in New York City recently and I said, I'd like some Naloxone. The pharmacist um, took my insurance and gave me a a few instructions about how to use the product. And then um, I paid $10 and walked out the door with Naloxone, which is now in my purse. I carry it with me everywhere in case I ever encounter someone that is in a crisis and needs help. Fentanyl test strips themselves are actually something that you can purchase on the internet. People buy it on Amazon. It's not that expensive. Uh, You can bring them with you even if you're not the one who needs to use them. You know, you can just have them with you. And if you have friends who kind of dabble in recreational drug use, it's pretty easy to uh, whip them out, explain how they're used, and make sure that everybody's safe out there on the dance floor. So fentanyl presents a unique challenge. It's hard to stop because it's so potent and so easy to smuggle. It's very cheap and therefore very profitable. And it had a precursor wave in the opioid crisis earlier of introducing new users. And the death toll is enormous. The U.S. has a long, decades-long history of a war on drugs that has been primarily focused on on abstinence and just saying no. And uh, in addition, harsh criminal penalties for, for dealers and mostly the lower-level dealers and users. Do you think with the acuteness of the crisis, uh, the fentanyl crisis, 
we are seeing or should see a departure from that approach? Well, I guess what I would say is that we are definitely seeing a departure from that approach. Anyone who sort of pays attention to the language that you'll hear in government will notice a couple of things. One is that instead of talking about stopping the cartels, you hear a lot of people talking about supply disruption. What that is, is sort of an admission that we cannot end the flow of drugs that is coming across the border. All we can do is disrupt that supply because there's just simply not enough resources to be searching to the level of granular detail that we would need to to really like pick up on all of the drugs coming across the border. Another um, new term that people might be hearing, even though it's actually not a new term, but it's new to hear from our federal government, is harm reduction. So rather than saying, you know, let's end drug use, you're hearing policymakers say, let's reduce the harm from drug use. So this can look like a lot of different things. Uh, For instance, in New York City right now, they have these centers called overdose prevention centers. Now, these are places where people are bringing in illegal substances and using them in the company of others so that if they do overdose, there's someone there who can reverse that effect to prevent them from dying. That is what somebody would call harm reduction. The idea is that it takes, you know, it might take 14 times for someone um, who's seeking treatment to actually be able to end drug use. And in the meantime, what can we do to reduce demand, reduce harm, take care of the people that are still out there using drugs to the extent that is possible for the world that they're living in? So you, you've been reporting on healthcare and public policy for years. What kind of lessons do you think we can take away from the country's experience with all these different waves of the opioid epidemic? Well, you know, one thing that we have not been particularly good at in this country is uh, monitoring the drug supply for a variety of reasons. Uh, We often don't know what is out there swimming in the drug supply other than through anecdotal information until sometimes, you know, years after the fact um, based on you know, what shows up in death certificates. And so what we're seeing now with an increasing number of other sort of synthetic drugs that are mixed in with fentanyl and meth and other kinds of illicit substances is policymakers are setting up drug monitoring programs together with harm reduction groups that work directly with drug users. So for instance, I visited a laboratory in Maryland that has been getting residue, I mean, essentially like a little cotton swab from inside dope bags in Maryland, testing it with this like incredible, you know, laboratory equipment, and then seeing exactly in real time what is in the drug supply, sending those reports back to the harm reduction organizations where they're literally putting it up on a whiteboard saying, here's what's in this bag of dope, here's what's in that bag of dope, and just trying to um, alarm, alert users to the extent that they can possible and the people that work with them and care for them about what they might be seeing and why out there. Uh, This is still in a very, you know, early stage. There aren't a ton of places doing this right now. And so for the most part, The way the information spreads about what is in the drug supply is from user to user in the United States. And who do you suppose could benefit if we had more perfect information? I think that there is a huge network of individuals that surround drug use that uh, really could use this information. For instance, when you talk to emergency room doctors, if somebody, you know, there are children that accidentally ingest the drug supplies of the adults in the room that show up. And, you know, if you're trying to treat an overdose in a child that you assume is from fentanyl and it turns out that it's actually a mix of other drugs, the treatment methods are different. And that could be the difference between that child dying and being able to save their life. So part of it is just literally about, you know, keeping people alive, knowing what's in the supply, etc. Julie Wernow, thanks for coming on American Scandal. Thank you for having me. That was my conversation with Julie Wernow, 
You can read her latest stories for The Wall Street Journal on the opioid crisis at WSJ.com. From Wondery, this is Episode 5 of Opioids in America for American Scam. In our next series, we look at the rise and fall of Spiro Agnew, the former vice president of the United States. Agnew was a firebrand who rose to power on a message of political populism, challenging the media and those he criticized as cultural elites. But Agnew was harboring a dangerous secret, one that would come back to haunt him as federal prosecutors began a wide-reaching investigation into political corruption. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode was produced by Alona Minkowski. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marsha Louie for Wondery. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to American Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.